For this project, we decided to use two types of stainless Damascus patterns. First is Damascus Steel's Dense Twist. The second pattern is produced by Vegas Forge out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Both patterns are really awesome. When it comes time to laying out the template, we like to use our wooden profiles and Sharpie markers. They're pretty proficient and work pretty well. Some people like to use die cam fluid and get a really super precise profile. They'll use a scratching tool to scratch around the edge. This is the same process many machinists use when laying out parts. It works really well and definitely offers a higher level of precision. If you are using a Sharpie marker, you may want to use one that's really new and doesn't have an old beat up rounded off tip that doesn't get very close to the edge of the profile. They also make a really small one. I think it's the one I just threw down there in the picture. It has a really micro fine tip and gets nice and snug right up against the profile. The next step is to begin laying out the bolsters and the pin arrangement. Oftentimes, I like to do all this kind of freehand. Sometimes I'll use a template, especially when I'm doing consistent knives or a batch of knives. But in this case, we're just making two, and so it's kind of simple, and I'm pretty good at getting things centered. Every once in a while, I might get something a little bit off, but for this instance, I think I'm going to be able to get it done just fine. So first, we lay out the bolster, the angle and the pitch, which the bolster will be out, and then its actual pinholes. It's important not to have the bolster pins too far to the edges of the handle because if you begin to round over the handle when you're grinding, you might actually take off more of the peened end of the pin than you want to, thus loosening or weakening the strength of the bolster pins. For our handles, we typically like to do a two-pin system. We use Corby bolts, which are a little bit more sophisticated than just regular old pins, and they are also a lot stronger. It's basically a threaded screw that you end up grinding the end off of once you've gotten the placement and the glue up done. You'll see how this works later in the video. Okay, just to go over this one more time, I'm doing the second knife. Here you'll see a quick trick that I use. It's nothing special, but it just kind of gets the job done. I lay the two knives together because they're going to be the same and the handles are definitely the same and I want the profiles to be the same. So it's like making a mirror image and I just match them up. Nothing special, but it's definitely a handy trick. Again, I can't really stress enough the importance of getting your handle pins straight in line with each other. Often many people will just do this freehand and without any kind of reference points and you just end up with sloppy pin alignment, especially when you have three pins over two. One other thing that I did that happened off camera, which is pretty important, is I used a center punch to place a deaton into each of the exact positions for the pins where they will be drilled. This is why we choose a two pin full arrangement for most of our knives. If we loaded up the knives with three 5 16 pins, it just feels like it would be a bit busy. Along the way, I also like to make sure that I'm checking my drill bits. We keep our drill bits in a little bin you can see me reach into over on the side. A lot of knife makers I know use either a 3 16 or quarter inch pin. Some people even use culinary rivets. I hate those things. They just come apart and they seem cheap. I'd just rather have my knife either be pinned together or using some other better fastener. Just while we're on it, I thought I'd mention something about safety. If you look at the knife and the way it's placed on the table, the long end of the knife is hanging out to the left. The drill turns clockwise. And so, if there were ever a reason for the bit to grab the material and want to hold on to it and pull it out of my hands, it's going to immediately hit the post in the back and not spin around and take off one of my fingers or worse. You might notice that I don't have any eyewear. That's absolute complete stupidity. If you're doing any of this kind of work, you should always have eyewear. There's really just no excuse because mills and drills and many of the tools we use in our shop just spit off 
nasty hot fragments that could get in your eye and just really screw you up. So for good practice, just make sure to always have some eyewear on. We'll get into dusk masks later. Now is the process for heat treating. In preparation, we will be using a stainless steel foil, which will protect the blade steel in the kiln environment from oxidization. The stainless steel foil which we use is the high temp version. There are two different grades of this foil. One is for high temp and one is for really high temp. It comes in rolls of 25 feet and we buy it from Jan Supply online. We use the high temp version and let me tell you, this foil is not cheap. Not only that, it's also sharp as a tack and will cut your finger faster than you can blink an eye. Two knives we're making in this video are made from a base metal of RWL34 or AEEBL, which are both high grade stainless. The kiln will reach a high temperature of 1950 degrees during the heat treat process. When the steel is in the oven at that temperature, it's being exposed to a lot of the oxygen that's in the environment as well. And this buildup of scale due to oxygen being in the kiln environment basically creates oxidization and burns off more of the metal than you want to. It can create a variety of different problems, so we try to eliminate it. By creating these little pockets made out of stainless steel wrap, we are effectively protecting the blade steel from this process of oxidization and scale buildup. Here I'm going to show how we make the little stainless steel pockets. It's kind of a pain in the butt, and like I said, you can get your finger cut so quickly, so be really careful if you choose to use this method. You can also buy these things online from Jans or from other suppliers. I think there are even some companies that sell this stuff for machinists who are making their own tooling and things like that. Regardless, again, as I said before, it's not cheap and it will cut you. The process begins by first measuring out the length you need for the blade you're going to put inside of it. It's very advisable to add an extra two inches or so because you're going to end up folding over the tips of the little pocket you're going to make twice. Since we're making two knives, we're going to get two pockets out of this one sheet that I originally cut out of the roll. Using a straight edge and a Sharpie marker can really help in order to get a nice clean line. When you're cutting it, I advise using some kind of metal cutting shears, like for roofing or whatever. They go dull quick, especially if you're trying to use scissors. Typically, I'll take the full sheet, fold it in half, and then fold each of the two halves that I've made so that I get a full pocket. We can get chef knives and other large knives in these types of pockets and because it's coming off of a roll we just make each section the length of the knife we're going to make. The next step from there is to begin closing up the pocket. Do that by making a 3 16th to a quarter inch fold over. You want to accommodate and make sure you have enough width so when you wrap this thing over twice that your blade is still going to be able to fit inside of it. Otherwise you've just wasted a bunch of material. After you've done your linear folds, you're going to do the folds on the end. Again, you're going to want to do these twice so that to really lock this thing up and make sure that no oxygen is going to get inside.
After that, you're just going to take a hammer or a block of wood or something like that and just really pound it down and get the seals really good and folded tight, leaving one end open so you can get the knife inside. Yep, this is the part where you get cut, trying to open the thing up to get your knife inside. So I kind of came up with this idea when I used to eat popsicles, those kind in the plastic thing, and I just take the end, open it a little bit, and blow in it, and it opens it up, the knife slips right inside. So you want to make sure you get it nice and flat before you close it up. And you also want to make sure that when you're putting the blade in that you don't just drop it in there. It is a foil and it's made out of stainless, but it's still fragile. And if you have a sharp tip on your knife, it can easily poke a hole down in the bottom. Even the smallest pinhole can ruin the whole thing and let the oxygen in. There's some folks that think that if you put a piece of paper inside with the foil, that it will burn off and use up all the oxygen to burn the paper. From everything I've read, that's just not true. And if anything, it just creates more problems than solutions. We use an even heat kiln, which I really love for our heat treating. It has a lot of programs which can be put into it for different types of heat treating processes. So here I'm going to be setting a program 6, which is our stainless program. That program is going to run for a while, then we'll insert the blades at around 1540 degrees. In the meantime, it's going to take some time for the kiln to build up its heat. I've kind of sped this up so you can see how that works. Here we go. Time to insert the blades. You're definitely going to want to use some tongs and some gloves. This is not like sticking stuff in an oven. The formula we created in the program settings allows us to have basically like a two minute window to get all the stuff in there. Once it does that, then the alarm will set and then the kiln will start going back up to temperature to reach its final destination of 1950 degrees. At this point, there will be a 10 minute soak period where the steel will soak and bathe in the heat before it's removed. At this temperature, this is like standing in front of a welder. The heat that's coming out of the kiln can really hurt you. So you don't want to just stand there in front of it and leave it wide open. Once the heat treat cycle is complete, the alarm will sound, letting us know it's time to pull them out. This is kind of the oh shit it's hot moment. We use aluminum blocks to dissipate the heat for the stainless. You'll notice I'm kind of tapping it in there so I get the whole thing in there. Then we take pressurized air and blow into the vise. This provides the final quench for the steel. You may notice that the aluminum blocks have been placed in a wooden vise. This is because it really helps us for keeping the blade straight. It basically acts like a press because the steel is so hot and soft, it's very malleable. I've heard some people say that you have to take the wrapping off the blade after it comes out of the oven. I've never really seen that done and I've never really tried either and it just sounds like something that could be dangerous. So I'm just gonna stick with the way we do it now. Here, let me speed this up a little bit. The air is injected to make the quench happen quickly. Stainless steels are usually what they call air hardening steels. And the cold air from the compressor just really helps make that happen very quickly. Here are the blades after they've been pulled from the stainless steel wrap and cooled. You can see where some oxygen made it into the top blade. Now it's time to temper the knives. Yep, toaster oven. That's how we do it. Can't remember exactly, but I think I got this one at the Salvation Army for about 25 bucks. Yeah, it kind of shows. 
After I'm done struggling with getting the things in there, I'll temper them twice, two different intervals. For these specific stainless alloys, we'll be tempering them at 300 degrees. This helps add flexibility and durability to the blade and remove some of the brittleness that may be associated with the heat treating process in the kiln. This really isn't rocket science. If you can bake a Pop-Tart, you can cook blades in the oven. It's really the digital thermometer that makes the difference. It allows us some level of precision during our tempering process. This should result in a blade roughly around 60 to 62 HRC. Now comes the next step of making the knives, grinding. In this section you'll see how we'll take the blank and shape it into a fully functioning blade ready for handle assembly. This process is very transformative. First we will begin using a heavy ceramic Cubitron 2 belt. This stage is noisy, messy, dangerous, and it can be really intensive. But it's also where some of the really dramatic changes happen to the blade. Because this process is lengthy and kind of boring, I'm going to cut it down to a couple short segments so you can see what's going on. It's also really important as we're grinding the knife to keep the temperature cool. So we keep a bucket of water by each of the grinding stations and we'll continuously dip the knife throughout the whole grinding process. Dust collection is another matter which we find to be pretty important. It's about our health and safety. The tube you see bouncing around is hooked up to a central vat collector that we keep outside. In addition to the dust collection, we also wear respirators. It's really important to protect your lungs as the chromium dust is very dangerous for your body. We work with a lot of stainless steel and stainless has a higher concentration of chromium than carbon steel. Notice that there is further profiling going on. Nick is working to get the profile of the blade exactly like he wants it, further adjusting it from the original profile that was drawn out, making small tweaks and changes that he finds to be necessary for the final piece. Now begins the process of beveling the blades. Bevel grinding is something that takes real skill. Someone like Nick here, who does it by freehand, is really amazing. Working on a grinder like this takes real hand-eye coordination and control. With each successive pass, he's taking more and more material away. By doing this, he's changing the geometry of the blade, making it so that the spine will have strength while the blade edge will be as thin as possible to accommodate the best cut it can make once it is sharpened. Symmetry is the name of the game in grinding a bevel. It is very important for both sides to be equal and meet in the middle. This is what is known as symmetric blade geometry. There are also blades that are asymmetric. Most of those blade designs come from Japan and have a very specific purpose in mind. We're getting near the next stage, polishing. Once again, the grinder configuration has been changed and we've gone to a wheel. This is a 30 micron belt, which Nick is using to give a full polish. On this knife, he has done what is called a partial grind. So the grind only goes up halfway up the blade and then remains flat or has a cheek on the top section. Now come the serrations. We're gonna use a small wheel jig and a cool mist to keep the blade cool at its very, very thin edge where we could ruin the temper. Nick is showing here how he uses an alternating serration. 
We believe that an alternating serration works better than a single side grime serration like you see on a factory made knife. The reason that they do that in the first place is purely for efficiency of production, not to provide you with better performance. Okay, now for the final sanding and polish. This takes forever, so I just decided to speed this up. It's probably the most laborious process of making a Damascus knife, but the end result helps to make the etch pop so well. For the etching process, we like to use two different types of acid. First, we start out with muriatic acid. It does a really deep etch in the stainless. You want to be really careful with muriatic acid. It's pretty nasty stuff. It can really hurt you, so you definitely also want to protect your lungs too because it produces really noxious gases. After the step of using the muriatic acid, then we move to the ferrochloric acid. It provides the real color, whereas the muriatic acid provides the real depth of the etch. In order to get really good results with the ferrochloric, you should experiment thyme and mixtures of water or vinegar with acid itself. Once the blade is dry, we do a small polish using a very, very low grit compound on our wheel. This helps to polish the blade and kind of bring off any oxides that may be loose or would otherwise end up in your food or in your hands or something like that. This is a small buffing wheel and it also has adjustable speed control, which is great. But I must tell anyone using this machine, I'm pretty sure it's the most dangerous machine in the entire shop. I've seen things launched completely from one end of the shop to the other within a blink of an eye. So now we're going to place our logo onto our knife using an electrochemical etching process. Basically what's happening here is we have a small vinyl sticker that has a top coating on it or a removable coating, which you'll see. The vinyl sticker is placed on the knife. Then once it's fixed and in place, the placement sticker is pulled off. That's the clear thing right there. Now the metal is exposed and we make preparations for placing some masking around it so that the electrically activated acid etch doesn't bleed off onto the blade and etch the blade where we don't want it. It's really important to use really good tape or something to act as a resist for the acid etch because it's very easy for that light thin fluid to get up under those tape joints. Now here we add the electrical contact. That's the positive lead. Now we take the contact pad and add some electrolyte to it. This pad will then react with the current and begin to etch the blade where there's no resist. By etching first, we're creating a deeper recess of the shape of the character. That way, when we go back behind it using the mark function, it will leave a dark black maker's mark down inside of the edge, which will be hard to remove. After it's done, then we switch the power over from DC to AC and begin marking the etched spot on the blade. That's what gives it the dark black color. It's basically a form of oxidization. Once this process is complete, we will remove the stencil and the masking. The final step in this process is to hit it with some pH so that it stops any further acid etch. Now it's time to begin constructing the handle. First we choose bolster stock. For these two knives, we're going to use copper and brass. So now going back to our early layout in the beginning of the video, you can see how the holes will line up with the positioning of the final bolster piece. The bolsters are marked and then cut from the stock on the bandsaw. Yeah, this section was not one of my finer points in filmmaking, so please excuse the uh, edits, but hopefully you get the idea. Okay. So now it's time to begin to mill the bolsters, get them shaped up, and prepared to be installed on the knife. This process takes a few steps that all happen on the mill. The setup for this process is pretty important to get it right. In particular, vicing up your material 
is extremely important that it is done right. If it is not, you can end up with a catastrophic failure of the bit or the mill, the material, or worse, you could end up with personal injury. Another key element is to remember to keep your material lubricated, particularly copper, and especially with small bits like eighth inch bits. They love to grab the copper and snap right off. I've seen projectile pieces of copper shot across the shop that would easily take out an eye. Some mills have a DRO, digital readout, which can make all this much easier. Ours just happened to be broken during the time of filming. Okay, so to make this whole drilling process a little easier to watch, I'm gonna speed it up a little. So in this project, you were using copper bolsters. Oiling the copper really helps. It really helps with any of the materials we work with, but copper seems to stick the most. This is definitely a good time to have on eyewear as sometimes the copper will stick to the bit and snap the bit and pieces go flying. Now we'll begin the process of milling the bolster stock so that it is square and true and also has the forward ramps which make the pinch point on the handle very easy. First we'll square up the front and back edges of the bolsters. Once again, I'm going to speed this little section up. Again, like I mentioned before, it's so important to get your materials viced up properly. I've seen several projects that have gone under the mill and get totally ruined because they weren't viced out properly. A lot of time can be lost this way. Definitely make sure you're vicing up your stuff really well. Now that we've milled one side, we're going to take a look at the finish, flip them around, and prepare for the second mill pass, and then both edges will be squared up. Now we're going to switch to the articulating vise. This will allow us to mill out an angle in the cheek of the bolsters. This is done so that we can rough the angle of the pitch that will be the pinch point on the front of the bolsters. Later, we'll clean all this up on the grinder. Okay, so there they are, nicely milled and ready for the grinder. From there, they'll get polished up, cleaned up, and ready for installation. So this is a small step that ensures that the pinnings are splayed out really nicely and you don't end up with little gaps around your pins after you've peened them down. We basically chamfer the holes just slightly so that the peening can actually overlap and make a nice tight fit. Next we take a deburring tool so that we can make sure that the holes are nice and clean on the inside and the pins will go in easily. This is particularly important because if your pins are not aligned or have issues going in and out of them, making them fit good, then when it goes time to glue it up, you're just going to be in a world of hurt. The last thing you want to have happen is to have to reset your bolsters after you put glue all over them. And I can say, been there, done that, and it's miserable. Now it's time to finish up these bolsters with some final shaping and some polishing before they get installed. Brass and nickel silver are all non ferrous metals and they conduct heat really well. So you're definitely going to want to have some water nearby if you're doing this by hand. It's 
really important when you're grinding your bolsters to definitely take the front edges to the highest polish that you plan to finish with so that you never have to do it while it's on the knife. Now they're looking pretty good and looking like they're ready for installation. Now it's time to prepare some handle stock. We're going to make some scales out of some resin based material that's produced by a fellow who runs an Instagram website and business under the name of Workerman. He makes excellent resin products, probably better than anybody else I've seen. And he also uses a process of 3D printing to make the bottom of the scales so that they have what he calls topography. This is where the scale fitment takes place. It's very important to get this all right one time with the bolsters and the scales all together. There really is no room for error in this operation. Okay, so for this section, I'm going to go ahead and just cut the volume track out of here because unfortunately, myself and the rest of the co-workers were arguing about where to place tables and how to rearrange the shop and it has nothing to do with the video that we're trying to put together here. So what we're doing here is preparing the blade to glue the bolsters and the handle stock onto the knife. Most of the times we'll do this in two phases, gluing the bolsters on first and then coming back after the glue is hardened and doing the handle stock. The glue we use is G-Flex, which is a marine grade glue made by West Systems. It's a fantastic glue. I haven't found anything else that I like better yet. We really enjoy working with it in the shop. It is a long curing glue usually takes about three or four hours for it to start to get too hard to really be able to apply but it stays malleable in order to like move things around or reshape things if you have to it also makes it easy to get things apart if you've made a mistake but all in all it's way better than the other glues that you'll find in the hardware store important when gluing on your scales and bolsters is to clean the blade tang very very well. We use acetone to do that. You want the oils of your hands and any kind of machine residue from grinding the steel off. You can see clearly that it's on the cloth. I even go to the distance of making sure to do the scales and the bolsters themselves. Some of you might say, oh, that's not really necessary. It's epoxy glue. But no, I can tell you from firsthand experience that it makes a huge difference. Another important thing to do is to wrap your blade. You really don't want to get this type of epoxy on your blade if you can help it. One of the reasons it's even more critical when working with Damascus is if you use any kind of tool, even if it's plastic or something like that, to try and push off the glue drippings that you may have gotten on your blade. You can easily scratch up the oxide finish and then have to go ahead and then re-dip your knife. It's a real pain in the butt to have to do that. Additionally, before you go ahead and begin gluing your knife, you want to have also have made sure that you dry fit everything together. You don't want to get in the middle of a glue up process and then start setting pins and find that they're not wanting to go in and having to bash them in. I've had many times where I thought I could just plow my way through it and end up cracking the scales because I was beating on the pins too hard.
notice how the fitment goes together nice and smooth without a lot of stress or strain or having to force anything. That's the way you want your knife to go together. Nice and snug, but you don't want to be beating on it and adding additional strain and stress to it that could only show up later. Now something I want to point out about this handle in particular is the fact that the pins are actually blind pins, which means that they don't go through the handle entirely. We're relying on the glue to do a lot of the work on this handle. The second knife which was produced with this set actually used Corby bolts. They went all the way through like traditional handle pins. Once you get everything fitted together in the gluing stage, you're going to want to use some kind of clamps. Some people like to use the welder's clamps, like the orange ones in the background. I prefer to use the small woodworker's clamps, but sometimes they both work and I'll use a combination of the two. There's also a knife maker's clamp that, that exists, but I don't really like using them. Coming from a woodworking background, these just seem to make sense for me. It's also important not to over clamp or over stress the clamps when you're clamping up your handle. It could be easy to squeeze out all the glue. By doing that, you're going to end up with a much weaker bond between the materials. In this last little section, while the bolsters are installed, I'm going to speed it up once more. The process is similar to the scales. So at this point, hopefully you understand how everything's going together. When putting on the bolsters, you want to make sure that you're getting the glue on the front edges of the scales and the back edges of the bolsters so that everything glues up nice and tight. The whole purpose of the glue is to seal the water out. The reason for this is because even though it's called stainless steel, it's not truly stainless. And once the water gets trapped under the handle parts, it can actually rust the knife quite badly in that area and then eventually make it fail and the handle fall off and then your knife is ruined. In this step we're going to begin to peen the pins which hold on the bolster. You want to really splay out the ends using a ball peen hammer. Using the round end it mashes the pins really far out like a mushroom making them fit tightly into the holes. They will later get ground clean. If you've done a good job installing and setting your pins and then peening them, you really shouldn't be able to see them once the knife is complete after everything's been ground and sanded and cleaned. Having a nice hard tabletop anvil is really helpful for this process. This one here is something I bought off of eBay for about 15 bucks. I think the shipping cost more than the actual block of steel. Then we drilled a little hole in it where we could actually run pins through it. Make sure that the block you buy for an anvil is made out of hardened steel. So here you can see how the pins look after they've been ground. Nice and clean. Almost entirely invisible. And that's exactly the look you're after. Now it's time to go back to the grinder for one last time. Handle shaping. In this stage you'll see how using different types of grits of belts will reveal a different finish for what you're after. It's also important to note there are different types of tool arms which will help in shaping your handle. Some will allow you to have broad, sweeping, curvaceous forms. Others will help you get in tight, like up under the choil, under the first finger. Some areas that can become difficult are where the handle transitions from a wood or a resin material or a micarta into the bolster stock. Basically, the harder metal versus the softer material. These are areas where you can easily dig into the handle and create problems. So it's really important to learn how to have good hand control 
and equal pressure on the knife against the abrasives. From this point, it's time to begin doing some hand work to finalize the knife handle. As we near the final stages, you'll see that using files is a very effective way of quickly moving material where you have greater control. Files are also helpful at providing different finishes and also at blending areas where different materials collide. I usually start out sanding with sandpaper in about 220 and work my way up to 6 or 800 grit depending on the handle finish. On resin like this, it's very important to go to the highest you can get to. You're going to need to work your way up into the really high grit papers, somewhere in the 2000 range, and using water, like wet sanding a car. As the saying goes, it's all in the details. What you put in is what you get out. This has been a really rewarding project and I want to say thanks to anyone who's been watching this video and been patient with us the whole time to see it through. We hope you'll check out our website sometime at www.monolithknives.com. Thanks so much for watching.